he has done most of the research and writing for what was the Complementary and Alternative Medicine website. And we have one of his publications out at our little table, which is on supplements and diet. Um, so he's going to talk with you today on that topic. So if he didn't send me his bio sketch, that I always, because I, I usually do a better job of introducing him than he would tell me. But um, when I think about what Tom does for his personal wellness, he takes great pleasure in his two children. What else, Tom? Music is big in your life. Travel. Yep. So what else do you do for your personal wellness? He's really good at living his talk, and so far as supplements and those types of things too. So, right? Yes. I'm turning it over to Tom. <clears throat> Okay, hello. So, um, yes, Karen is a great publicist. If you ever need an introduction, you should call Karen. Um, so, Dr. Bolmer is a tough act to follow, um, but actually, pretty it, will, it dovetails my talk dovetails pretty well into what Dr. Bolmer's talk was saying. Okay, someone's giving me the talk louder. I'll get you in a minute. Forward, backwards, laser. Uh, you can use that too. Okay, great. Um, but I think it was just saying that I think that what I have to say dovetails pretty well with what uh, Dr. Vollmer was saying. So that there's a certain sphere, medications, um, uh, decision making, where you do that in consultation with an expert. And then there's another world of decision making in your own care that has to do, I mean, that will <coughs> allow you to make decisions independently. So, in other words, if you want to start. Tysabri and you have a bunch of risk factors for PML, you're not going to be able to start it because the expert you're consulting with probably will not start that medication. However, with a diet or dietary supplement, you're really on your own. So there's a whole different decision-making process. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time trying to educate, I hope, about how to go about that decision-making process and um, and how to evaluate evidence. And then I'm gonna get very specific, so from the very general to the very specific information about vitamin D and fish oil, and uh, at least one approach to diet. So, uh, so what we can take for granted with FDA approved therapies, they're certainly not a one size fits all therapy, as you just heard. But we can take for granted that enough experts have evaluated an FDA-approved therapy that it works, at least in a group of people. And when you're talking about dietary supplements, often you really don't have that to take for granted, as you'll see. So usually, these kinds of therapies have been established better than a placebo based on a large randomized controlled clinical trial. And again, once you start getting into the world of dietary supplements, a lot of times that's not the case. Sometimes it is, and we're going to review a few of those today where there actually have been randomized controlled clinical trials. Um, so actually, uh, I didn't really talk with Dr. Bomer about his talk before him, but it was just this slide, of course, in great detail. But how do you make decisions about FDA-approved medications? So there are prognostic clues, and again, the key part is that you're making this decision in consultation with an expert. What about unconventional therapies? Again, as I was saying, these differ from FDA-approved therapies in two ways, I guess, at least. One is you're often not as sure about whether it's going to work. And two, you get to make all of the decisions for yourself. So that creates a responsibility to understand what you're doing and why. I think it's probably even higher than it is with FDA-approved therapies. And I think that, um, there's, there's a distinction, mostly, people use just to kind of be, have sort of semantic hygiene on this issue. A lot of people talk about unconventional therapies being that other than what the physician prescribes or healthcare pro provider prescribes. And then that's broken into two categories. Alternative, which is you don't use what the physician says or you don't use conventional medicine. That's so-called alternative medicine. And then complementary medicine is of course, when you use complementary therapies in addition to what was recommended by your physician or other healthcare provider. 
And I think that there was a time in MS care where alternative medicine wasn't really um, such a bad idea. I mean, at least it was understandable that the medications were only partially effective, highly expensive, and injectable. But I think now we're at the point where there's so many therapies that, and there's, the access programs are so good that outside very special cases of maybe benign MS, pretty much, I think that, there, that there's really no need to consider alternative medicine anymore. It's pretty much, and I don't think many people do this, specifically rejecting all medications, but I think it's, it's no longer really relevant, I think, for most people to have alternative medicine as sort of a model. And, but still alive is the idea of complementary medicine. So, um, in fact, what sort of the model that we created was a model uh, that Karen mentioned. I think we have some books out there, and it's a little out of date, and that's just the way it is with um, science, and it's evolving. But what we talked about was a five-step approach. Right? So the idea is you use every arrow in the quiver, and this would be complementary medicine, right? So you take, um, you start with FDA-approved therapies, right? and then something with diet and dietary supplements. That's sort of a second category. Then mind-body medicine, something in that category. And then exercise. You know, some people talk about Tai Chi or yoga. I would think about those things as forms of exercise. And for me, I would think of jogging being in that same category. And then number five, sort of the fifth step, would be symptom management. You know, so and then you use an integrative approach to symptom management too. So again, sort of the FDA-approved therapies. Most people should be doing something in that category for managing their MS. Maybe diet and dietary supplement. There are some reasonable options. Three, mind-body medicine. Four, exercise. And five, an integrative approach to symptom management. Okay, so I think that about um, I've tried to present this before, and I want to. Say up front, I'm not trying to convince anyone to believe or not to believe in God, but this is a, um, a seminal work in decision theory. This is Pascal's wager. Right? And what Pascal said many years ago, hundreds of years ago, centuries ago, he said there are really only two possibilities. God exists or God doesn't exist. And I can believe in God or I cannot believe in God. And then he kind of created this box, this decision matrix, and said, well, there's really only one place to be here, right? There's only one way to get that benefit, and that's to believe, and even and there's no harm in it. It's ultimately what's going on here. And um, I think that with some uh, modification, that's what people do probably in a less formal way when making decisions about unconventional therapies. So if you take something like, it's just to make it really easy, massage for spasticity, right? I mean, put aside the, the question of how much it costs, you can do the same thing. The massage is going to help with, let's say, your spasticity, or it won't, or you can try it, or not try it. And then really there's only one way to get that benefit, and there's really very little downside, right? So I think that what's, as Voltaire would have said, Voltaire, as another philosopher, he would have said, well, just because it's in my interest to believe in something doesn't make it true. Right? And Pascal would say, I didn't say it was true, I said it's in my interest. And I think that this is, the, this is sort of the way a, a, the physician might look at the world, is really I want truth, and that's FDA-approved therapies. And I think patients will say, well, what's a reasonable gamble? Right? And so that's how you go through the decision-making process, at least with respect to unconventional therapies. And so before we get kind of right into the nitty gritty of what this latest science is um, uh, about vitamin D and fish oil and some other things, we just take a second to look at what the different kinds of evidence are. And so you can start with anecdotal evidence. Right? That's a story that somebody says, hey, I tried this and I got better. It's a very low level of evidence. Um, Pat Daly usually talks about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and somebody said, well, I had a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then I started to feel great, right? Well, obviously MS waxes and wanes and just because there's that temporal connection for one person doesn't necessarily mean that that was an effective therapy, right? So a very low level of evidence. Laboratory evidence, that's, well, this is good in cells. This does good thing for cells. It reduces inflammation in a test tube. So therefore, I'm gonna take it. That, that, that's too big a leap. Very minimally persuasive. 
And then you start moving up the scale a little bit, animal evidence, there's an animal model of MS, well something works in the animal model of MS, maybe a dietary supplement, well that's more interesting. But again, it's still a long way from proving that it's gonna help in a group of people with MS. 